Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Jeannie Hay, uh, for any of you who don't know me, uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm really glad that you're here on one of certainly my favorite days of the year for the College of Arts and Sciences, where we celebrate research, which we're particularly uh, good at, and, um, and we get to learn about uh, the research of the person who's received the highest honor for research, which is our lead key chair, and this year it's um, uh, Dr. Teresa Javajinsky, um, who is more deserving than I can even say. And one of the things that I especially appreciate about these opportunities is we, I at least, don't know, only learn incredible new science or other research, the details, but we often learn about the journey that the person has taken in uh, their research career, which is always uh, wonderful. So thank you for being here. We have a reception in the Bush boardroom um, right after this. Uh, wine, drinks, uh, yummy food, so please stay and imbibe. And with that, I would say congratulations, Teresa, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. That's the talk quickly so that we can get to the beer quicker part of it, huh? So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, so I was fed a steady diet of Jack Hanna and Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom when I was growing up, um, in addition to... Uh, healthy exposure to growing up dogs. Um, check out that surly teenage expression and tragic bangs there. Yeah, thanks, Linda, thank you. There'll be more of those to come here. Um, perms, right? Who, whoever, why didn't anybody just say don't do it? Um, and lots of vacations to animal theme parks and zoos. Um, often in matching outfits with my considerably much younger sister. Um, my mom thought that a five-year age difference didn't matter, um, as you see there. Um, I also look incredibly disturbed to be holding those two birds. I was always that person that was picked in the audience to do the, you know, participation part. I don't like birds, never liked birds, <laughs> didn't like birds at that moment. My sister is in the background being like, why couldn't I be the one to hold the birds? And, of course, manatees, which I will come back to a little bit here. So how did I go from dolphin hugger, dolphin trainer wannabe, to the harried professor that you see here? Um, walk with me as we take a journey from I want to make a difference in the world to... I want to make a difference in the world, but in a little different way. So we live in a world of what ifs and should have, could haves. Um, it's human nature to often reflect back on choices that we've made and wonder what would have happened if we had taken a different path. Um, that's anything from whether or not we should have had that double scoop of campfire s'mores ice cream in the cafeteria. Answer to that is always yes. Um, to what on earth was I thinking when I decided to have an all essay based final exam? So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the big choices that I made or that the universe helped make for me and some of the important people along my journey that have helped shape, make me not just the professor that I am, but the person that I am today. Um, so what you see here is my undergrad life. Um, like many of us, I was faced with a number of choices for undergrads, and I chose the place that offered me the most money. Um, because even back then, my parents had told me what college loans were. Um, 
When I got there, as my dad can probably remember, I said, oh my God, what have I done? This place is terrible. Um, take me home. I want to do anything else but go here. Um, he said, no. Let me get you some cinder blocks for your bed, and I'm off to the airport. Um, thank goodness for that, um, because along the way, I made these lifelong friends. I became a world-renowned DJ, if only in my head. Um, and most importantly, I got to spend a semester watching octopuses and eating lunch next to dolphins. Now, Southampton required a research thesis, and it encouraged their students to go off and go wherever they wanted to go. Um, I had something lined up in Australia to go and study dugongs. I was super excited about that. Um, at the last moment, life had other plans. Um, luckily, life had that other plan um, because I got to go to Italy because another student had had cold feet um, and decided they didn't want to go there. I had just happened to take a class in animal behavior yeah, even back then, there were classes in animal behavior. And I remembered reading this paper from this guy who did this stuff with octopuses where he was actually training them to watch other octopuses open containers to get to food rewards. Um, so I shot him an email um, in that... 21-year-old way where you're like, oh, of course, this, you know, person out there is going to answer my email. And I'm pretty certain I was like, yeah, you know, I've read your work, so you should totally take me in it. Um, he did. <laughs> Why? I don't know. But I was really glad that he did. Um, that helped me realize that there were careers out there where people could work with animals every day that wasn't just being in a zoo or at an aquarium. Because by the time I was 16, I'd already realized that the aquarium life probably wasn't for me as I was asking questions at SeaWorld that the trainers couldn't answer. Um, and yeah. It led me on this path where I get to watch animals all day. So this next step is how I learned that fish are cool. Never thought that I would learn that. Um, and what it means to be a good mentor. So when I was applying for graduate schools, again, in that naive 20-something way where you just shot off a couple of emails and assumed that things would just work out the way that you wanted them to. Um, I wound up getting offers at two different places um, that would have had me looking at two very different things. Um, one was to go and study capuchin monkeys, which, you know, crap, capuchin monkeys, pretty awesome, right? Um, and the other was to study fish. Yeah. So you see this guy down here at the bottom. Um, this is Bill Rowland. I'm going to still tear up all of these years later. Um, he was this crazy, boisterous man from New York who talked a mile a minute and couldn't not use his hands when he's excited. Um, I think I might have inherited that from him. Uh, he also would raise his voice when he was really passionate about something. I don't know anybody else that <laughs> might do that either. Um, but he showed me that it's okay to be passionate. 
and to speak up and have a voice when you're really excited about something. And the many uses of duct tape, um, although maybe not to tape electrical outlet extension cords above tanks full of water um, because the duct tape doesn't really hold as well as you think it might. Um, and you learn a valuable experience about how quickly your reflexes can actually move when that power strip hits the tank full of water. Um, to which your advisor says, well, yeah, I could have told you that, but you didn't. Um, and most importantly, he taught me the true meaning of the word mentor, and that it's different than being an advisor, and that graduate students aren't just there to get you some more papers. Um, they're real people, and if you treat them like real people, you can make a lab family. Um, and so that's how I learned to love fish, and not monkeys. So that brings me to the next step of my journey, the UNE phase. Um, I defended my thesis, and I was faced with another choice. Uh, do a postdoc at a pretty prestigious place, um, or accept a job offer in this department where I would be the only faculty member teaching animal behavior um, at a time when it was called psychobiology, um, which sounded like it was full of crazy biologists. Um, but in my heart, I knew that what I wanted to do was to teach at a small liberal arts school. I had had such an amazing experience at Southampton, the place that I begged my dad not to leave me at, um, that that's what I was looking for. So why take the postdoc when I could skip it and do what I wanted to do all along? Um, and here I am all of these years later, still at this place, although not called a crazy biologist anymore, at least not to my face. <laughs> so this UNE when I started at UNE was different than UNE now. Um, I had what can best be described as a research cubicle that moved depending on where the class needed to be at that time. Um, we had maybe 15 majors, 20 majors at most. Um, so trying to get a student excited in working with fish was a little bit difficult, no matter how loudly you spoke when you were passionate about them. Um, and I understood that because I was the 20 something that was like, what fish? Um, so it was a little bit of a struggle. Um, and I have three things to thank um, from a slow crawl to being a productive researcher here. Um, and the first is the How to Write a Lot group. Um, so Jen Weaselquist, who's here today, um, read this book about how to write a lot in a little bit of time um, that was geared expressly for people at small liberal arts schools that were trying to do science and do scholarship in environments that weren't necessarily conducive for them. Um, so she was the department cheerleader at the time, and she got myself and Marianne Corsello into this um, with these two stamps, the win and the fail stamp. And I made it my mission to never get that fail stamp. So we would meet every few weeks, and we would come up with these lists of attainable goals 
Um, and sometimes I decided I needed to be even a little bit better than the win one and just go one step more than my to-do list. I'm sure neither of them remembered that at all. Um, but that was really the motivation that I needed to actually start writing here. Um, the second one was dedicated research space. Thank you. Um, it made a massive difference to not have mysterious fish deaths that would always happen in the middle of a crucial data collection time. Never at a point where we could recover from it, always at a, nope, we are not going to contribute our lives to science. We're just going to say, F you, die, and leave you weeping in the corner of your research cubby. So when I got a space that had temperature control and lights that turned on and off, not just when I raced in and raced out at the end of the day, it made a big difference. And being able to have more fish meant that I could have actual teams of research students. And not just one that stayed for a year or maybe two, but ones that came in and stayed for four years. Um, so the group in the red t-shirts is my first group where I had two freshmen that were with me for the whole four years. Um, and that was a really big deal. Um, the woman in the far right, Meg Walsh, is the first student that I got to take to an international conference. She actually won a travel award to do it. First time she'd ever left the US and we were on a plane to Brazil and she was presenting her research from this, at that time, really small institution. Um, so these three were the nexus that I needed um, to actually attain tenure here. Um, and then I got tenure, and then I got kind of bored with what I was doing. Um, I was doing research because I liked the questions I was asking. Um, we found out that, at least in fish, parents are right. Who you hang out with really does matter. Um, working with Christina Perazio, who's actually a lecturer here now, um, we found out that whether or not you knew your social partner before made a difference with how you interacted with them later on. Uh, we found out that in Siamese fighting fish, there are these three different morphs in males and that females actually care whether a male is a lover, a fighter, or a divider. Um, dividers are males that kind of split their time between a, a female and a male. Um, and mostly it's that they don't want anything to do with the fighters more than they care about the ladies' man. So I answered these questions and I was like, well, this is good, but I want to do more. I want to make a difference. Um, and at that time, I had this student that was gifted to me um, by Dr. Amy Kierstead. I got this email that said, hey, I had this med bio student. She interviewed with me, but her you know, schedule didn't really work with mine. Do you think you might have space? for her in the lab. Um, thanks, Dr. K. Uh, because Lady Olivia helped shape 
my research program so that now we ask applied questions like, what does all of the junk that is out in the water do to fish behavior? Um, so I can tell you a little bit about what she did. Um, endocrine disrupting chemicals are these man-made chemicals that mimic the properties of real hormones. They make them especially dangerous because the vertebrate endocrine system is primed to take them in because they act just like real hormones. Um, basically anything that you can think of that we produce is probably an endocrine disrupting compound. Um, things from birth control pills to plastics to sunscreen. These are all endocrine disrupting chemicals. So they interfere with the endocrine system in vertebrates. They have morphological effects, physiological effects, and what we're most interested in, behavioral effects. Um, males are especially sensitive to these chemicals. They lead to things like abnormal development of secondary sexual characteristics, like you see in the frog over there, where the male has both male and female reproductive organs, um, delayed sexual maturity, reduced male typical behavior, so males that are supposed to act aggressively or court ladies don't do those things anymore. They kind of just hang back. Um, and so the exposure to these things can negatively impact fitness. So. Males that aren't going to court females aren't going to mate, which is a problem with keeping that species going. We've done a lot of studies to address this, um, including two that I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, one that looks at ethanyl estradiol, which is the active ingredient in birth control pills. Um, and how it interferes with boldness and decision-making in male Siamese finding fish. And then another one that looks at a compound called fluoxetine and what it does to behavior in both males and females. So this is work that was done with Liv Hebert. Lindsay Lavin and Jody Marks. Um, all of these studies that I'm going to talk about have been done exclusively with undergraduate assistants. Um, over 37 at last count. Um, yeah. So what we did is we gave males this situation where they have to... Um, decide if they want to court a female or attack a male or split their time between the two. We looked at what they did before they were given ethanyl estradiol. So this is an estrogen mimic. Um, you can probably make some predictions about what might happen if you give males estrogen. Um, and then we looked at what happened after they had this, right? The overall responses to both of these dummies was reduced after they got that female mimicking hormone. Right? So they court less, they attack less. It's very clear here. And this is the case in both behavior to the female and behavior to the male. What was most interesting was with this is we were really the first lab to tie this into other fitness-related behaviors. So other labs had looked at courtship and aggression and a number of other fish. Um, but Liv wanted to do something different. Um, she always wanted to push herself a little extra mile. Um, so we tied in these boldness assays. So looking at what might happen when a male is just kind of alone in an empty tank, what might happen when they're in a brand new environment that they've never encountered before, and her favorite, the novel object case, um, where males encountered things like a kaleidoscope, 
a little uh, apple slice magnet, ceramic dog that she stole from her mom's little ceramic menagerie. Um, yeah, she was always bringing in new little objects because in order to be a novel object, they can't have encountered it before, right? So we needed to have lots of objects to draw from. Um, and she left some of those behind in the lab. Little uh, plastic monkey wearing a fez. That's my favorite. Um, and as you'll see here from the graphs, um, exposure to that estrogen mimic reduced activity levels in all of those um, assays. Levels of boldness are usually correlated across assays in males that haven't been exposed. Uh, we call it kind of fish personality. So if they're really bold in one of these assays, they'll be really bold in another assay. If they don't move very much in one, they don't move very much in the other. Um, if you give them this estrogen mimic, this doesn't happen anymore. There are behaviors all over the case. Um, and it makes them way less consistent. So the first time they are encountering a novel object, they will behave very differently than the second time they encounter it, whereas if they didn't have exposure to this um, pseudo-hormone, that wouldn't be the case. So the next study looked at fluoxetine. You may know fluoxetine better by its brand name, Prozac. Um, so yes, we gave fish Prozac and looked at what happened. Um, this work was done with Liv again, and then um, Brenna Campbell, Lindsay Lavin, and Jess Kane. So I finally am starting to have overlap in my team, where the more senior students can train the more junior students, which was a huge help because I didn't have to do everything all of myself anymore, but it was also really sad because I didn't get to do everything all by myself anymore. They don't tell you that part when you finish graduate school, that the reason why you got into science, you get to do less and less of the further you progress in your career. So what happens when you give fish Prozac? Nothing good. Right. So Prozac reduces boldness. It does so in a dose-dependent manner. So if you give them more of it, it has a greater effect. This happens even after you put them in clean water. Yeah, so even if we try to solve the problem by removing the compound, it doesn't matter. Weeks after they've been back in clean water, they still act as if they're in polluted water. Um, and we're not talking big doses here. Um, so, right, these are tiny doses that are found out in the wild. Um, big problems. It also affects um, their personality. So the higher dose reduce consistency, so they're all over the map from trial one to trial two. Um, it also led to the loss of the relationship between behavior from one context to the other. And again, this was greater when they were exposed to the higher dose. So what does this mean beyond we're all screwed? Um, Prozac reduces boldness. It reduces consistency. It reduces behavioral relationships across contexts. Um, while greater effects were seen in the higher dose, even the tiny dose had a big effect. Um, and Perhaps the most disturbing thing is, is we used to think that females were safe. It was just the males that were susceptible to all of these things out in the wild. It's like, yeah, ladies, finally we get a break. 
No. Females were just as affected as the males were. Um, and that finding actually led um, to some really big discoveries for us. Um, so we actually were featured on Discovery Channel online. Um, we were on How Stuff Works. We had this great cartoon made about us. We were a team poised to take over the world. Um, and then the universe decided I needed another lesson. So I took a year off while my amazing team and some really wonderful colleagues kept things going. Um, they kept things going so well that we actually had three posters at the Spring Symposium that year. Um, and I was hellbound and determined to come back because if this can happen when I'm not there, what the hell can happen if I'm there, right? Um, so first I went to Disney World because that's what you do when you have to celebrate a big comeback, right? Um, and then I got back to business um, because there were all of these new students waiting to help me make science happen. Um, I had some great returning labbies, and we had just read a really bad study on a really interesting topic which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, but first, I have to talk about somebody who was just waiting to have their moment in the spotlight. Yeah, so this is Jazz. <laughs> um, and Jazz had been on a couple of other studies. Um, one that showed that ethanyl estradiol did some messed up things to fish, um, and another one that showed that antiandrogens um, do equally messed up but different things to fish, which she was like, what the heck? They're the same pathway. It should have the same effect. So she's just there waiting to ask, what might happen if you give them these same things? So she and her team, Amber, who was just here, um, and Sam completed this study last year. Yeah, we're such a powerhouse now. We can run a study in a year. Um, and she found that it was actually the ethanyl estradiol that had a greater impact um, and had some pretty interesting ideas about why that might happen. Um, but I'm not going to spoiler alert those because we're like two weeks from getting it out under review. So <laughs> we'll wait for the big message. Um, but I want to get back to that really bad study that we had read. Um, so there's this compound called benzophenone 3. Um, it's been getting a lot of media attention lately. It's the compound in sunscreen that they banned in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is actually giving out tourists natural sunscreens because BP3 has been linked to coral bleaching. Um, and as far as we could tell, nobody had looked at what might happen if you give BP3 to a vertebrate, except for this really bad study with a sample size of less than 20 and concentrations that if they were found in the wild, we'd all be like having extra limbs by now or something, right? Um, so I happen to have some 
environmental science minors and double majors in my lab as well. Um, so they went gangbusters on this. Um, in addition to one of our new recruits, Cassie, who's here. Um, and so what they did is they used these four assays that we know a lot about, actually five, because they exposed them to a male conspecific on their own and a female conspecific on their own, and then a shoal and a novel environment and an empty tank. Um, and they found that BP3 does really bad things to vertebrates, too, um, at doses that we actually see in the wild. Um, and we just got an email today that this paper is in the revise and resubmit stage. So hopefully there will be a better paper out there showing that BP3 has effects on fish. Um, so this was a really big year for me. Um, I not only had one of my most amazing lab groups ever, I had a fantastic um, group of students in the classroom, and it was kind of scary to come back after what I had to come back from. So to be able to do it in such a big way um, was huge. And I've learned some lessons. Um, I've learned that you can make a lot of science happen for very little money when you have great teams, supportive department chairs, um, and a hell of a lot of determination. I've learned that it's important to show students that there's more than just science that happens at conferences, like meeting congressmen and being daring enough to try oysters for your first time and then proceeding to eat the rest of the dozen oysters that was not meant for you. Uh, we've gone to Alaska, and Nicole got to see a moose up close and personal, which was her life goal. Um, we've had some questionable fashion choices. They would kill me if they knew that that picture was up there. Um, I, I've learned that science is awesome, period. Um, and that I need to listen to the ideas and the interests of my students, just like my graduate student, um, graduate school mentor did for me, um, because I had a lot of ideas back then, um, and I'm sure People that walked by us in the hall thought we were yelling at each other, and instead we were just being, raising levels of passion at, at each other. Um, yeah, so I've learned that you can let them fledge, and they will surprise you. Um, that they go on to not just do great things, but to be really amazing people. Um, I've learned that rewards are really important. Um, authorship is pretty amazing. Um, and I've been able to do that for nearly 30 students. Um, but small rewards are really important too, like celebrating accomplishments with brownie sundaes and having lab t-shirts and just dance-a-thons, even if Sunny and Funky have retired their rendition of Katy Perry's Hot and Cold. Um, and I will look for any occasion to justify buying presents from the Target dollar section. 
Rewards are important, but caring is even more so. Um, don't be stingy with praise or with chocolate. They're both equally necessary. Try to never be too busy to spare five minutes um, because chances are that's the five minutes of the day that you'll remember the most. And mentoring goes beyond the science parts. We're not just building the next generation of researchers. We're building the next generation of citizens that we want to go out there and not elect the people that we currently have in office. <laughs> right? And so I'm doing my job to help make that doesn't happen. Um, thank you doesn't convey enough for what I have to say for everybody that I have met here at UNE, um, but it's a start. And I'm so grateful for being able to work with all of these amazing students and colleagues, and I can't wait to see what's next. And I'm awfully grateful that this award is enabling me to take some people to Puerto Rico at the end of February when you need to get the hell out of Maine at the most. Um, and with that, thank you and any questions? Um, why did you choose it? What's it good for? Like, again, you know, coming from non-lab non science background, um, why these particular fish? So the Siamese fighting fish are not my beloved species. Um, they are easy to work with. There are not a lot of people that work with them. And we can use both males and females, which was really important to me. Um, my true love lies in the illustrious three-spine stickleback that I got to work with in grad school. That fish is the god among fish. <laughs> That blue eye and red belly, there is not a greater courtship color in the world. Um, yes, and we're gonna get back out there this spring and get us some stickleback, because it's been too long. Yeah, thank you.